Harper Audio presents My Life Among the Serial Killers, Inside the Minds of the World's Most Notorious Murderers, by Helen Morrison with Harold Goldberg, read by Helen Morrison. The downtown Chicago summer night was filled with the wind-spun perfume of nearby roses and freshly mown lawns. My children were in bed, the youngest sleeping soundly, with dreams of magic and Harry Potter, and the oldest sleeping the hard sleep that comes after playing three periods of ice hockey. Across the street, a young couple walked hand in hand, and their laughter echoed as they passed out of view. My neighbors pulled up in their car, and I waved to them. Dressed to the nines, they'd just celebrated their wedding anniversary, and they waved back as they moved inside their house. As their door closed and the neighborhood fell completely silent, I began to think about my own life and the fact that my children and my neighbors knew only in the most general terms what I do in my professional life. Our friends recognize that I'm a psychiatrist who deals with very difficult cases, and perhaps it's better that they don't know any more than that. My two boys don't know why I sometimes leave for weeks on end. Not yet. What I do is so very far removed from this thriving, affable neighborhood, the satisfaction we get from planting oak saplings with the community association, the occasional elegance of charity galas or the opera, that most everyone would be shocked to hear about it. After a few minutes, I went inside our four-story brick house, a nearly perfect place that was my husband's grandfather's and father's home and office, where they practiced medicine for decades. In the back of the first floor is a former examination room that now serves as my workspace when I'm at home. Its walls are coated with tin, still there from years gone by. It's the history here, the cheerful medical attention given to the neighborhood for over 80 years by the good doctors, that inspires me. I pulled from a beige-colored folder some pictures of a child, a girl not only murdered brutally, but also battered, nearly beyond recognition. Sometimes I don't think I can take the sight of one more photograph of an innocent whose life has been so senselessly taken. In preparation for a keynote address to a coroner's group, I jotted down some notes onto a legal pad about the number and location of each wound on her lifeless body. Nearby were wire mesh baskets with reams of other notes, replete with the pictures of other girls and boys, all murdered. This is not uncommon work for me. It is what I do, and I believe it is what I was meant to do. Admittedly, it's not the work that most would choose, but I am what people now call a profiler, three short syllables that have given my professional research life a determined focus and purpose. For the past 30 years, longer than I care to remember, I've been privy to the most devious inner workings of serial murderers, and I have been compelled to traverse both the country and the world in a kind of solitary, endless journey to discover who they are, where they are hiding, and why they kill. Sometimes I think I know too much about them, certainly more than just about anyone in the world. But even as my knowledge of these murderers increases each day, my great fear is that I will never know enough. I am not a profiler in the way you've seen on television. A few years ago, Allie Walker starred as the smartly dressed Samantha Waters in the CBS television series The Profiler. Waters said she worked via thinking in images, picturing killers via colorfully edited montages in her mind in a kind of extrasensory perception that helped her track down serial murderers. While she could never exactly control her visions, they always seemed to arrive at precisely the dramatic moment that moved the story forward into that most crucial element of prime-time television, the commercial. As for me, I am not clairvoyant in any way. Unlike Sam Waters, I do not see detailed cinematic flashes of what happened in the past or what will happen in the future. 